Next up is the Friar. Now, the Friar is going to be an example of uh, someone who is critiqued a little bit more. The next two are going to be the Friar and the Pardoner. And these are examples of some of the, the, the heavier, more intense satire, where you can actually see him uh, be a little more direct in critique uh, what he sees here from many members of the church. All right. Uh, there was a friar, a wanton one, in Mary, and you can see our, our words here on the right meaning jolly. A limiter, a very festive fellow, in all four orders there was none so mellow, so glib with gallant phrase and well-turned speech. He'd fixed up many a marriage, giving each of his young woman what he could afford her. He was a noble pillar to his order. Highly beloved and intimate was he, with country folk within his boundary, and city dames of honor and possessions. Wait a minute. Does that say giving each of his young women what he could afford her? Yes, it does. Let's keep going. For he was qualified to hear confessions, or so he said, with more than priestly scope, he had a special license from the Pope. Sweetly he heard his penitence at shrift, with pleasant absolution for a gift. He was an easy man in penance giving, where he could hope to make a decent living. Now, this would be, I think, an important few lines to highlight, which is why I highlighted them before. Um, because this is going to play into... Well, let's see. There's one word I want to make sure you get down in your notes here. Here we go. We'll see if I can type it here. Indulgences. Look at that. I did it. I'm proud of myself. Uh, indulgences. What is an indulgence? What do we mean by this? It means when you pay to have... This is a very simple non-theological definition, but it's good enough for our purposes here. Uh, an indulgence is when you would pay to have your sins forgiven. Uh, and this is something that the church did for many, many years, uh, especially here in the Middle Ages. It's something that eventually a man named Martin Luther would protest against and many others, and now we're getting off track. But uh, our friar here is someone who gave very easy penance to people. Uh, why? Where he could hope to make a decent living. He has a reputation here. You pay him, you go see him, boom, your sins are forgiven. It's a sure sign whenever gifts are given to a poor order that a man's well shriven. And should he give enough, he knew in verity, the penitent repented in sincerity. Well, how do we know that someone really wants to get forgiven? Well, they're going to pay a lot. For many a fellow is so hard of heart, he cannot weep for all his inward smart. Therefore, instead of weeping and of prayer, one should give silver for a poor friar's care. Or kept he kept his tippet stuffed with pins for curls and pocket knives to give to pretty girls, as a friar does, apparently. And certainly his voice was gay and sturdy, for he sang well and played the hurdy-gurdy. I know you're all curious about what the hurdy-gurdy is here. A stringed instrument played by cranking a wheel. There's your trivia question. Maybe we'll make that the bonus question on the midterm. What is a hurdy-gurdy? And if you tell me it is a musical instrument... Maybe I'll give you a point. We'll see. At sing-songs, he was champion of the hour. His neck was whiter than a lily flower, but strong enough to butt a bruiser down. He knew the taverns well in every town, and every innkeeper and barmaid, too, better than lepers, beggars, and that crew. Who's he choosing to spend his time with? Not the lepers and the beggars. Who would do that? I mean, like Jesus, probably the parson. But no, he's going to go hang out at the taverns 
to have a drink. He's great at a party, this guy. For in so eminent a man as he, it was not fitting with his, the dignity of his position, dealing with a scum of wretched lepers. Nothing good can come of dealings with the slum and gutter dwellers, but only with the rich and victual sellers. But anywhere a profit might accrue, courteous he was, and lowly of service too. Natural gifts like his were hard to match. He was the finest beggar of his batch. And for his begging district pay, paid a rent, his brethren did no poaching where he went. For though a widow mightn't have, have a shoe, so pleasant was his holy how-do-you-do, he got his farthing from her just the same before he left, and so his income came to more than he laid out. And how he romped, just like a puppy. He was ever prompt to arbitrate disputes on settling days, for a small fee, in many helpful ways. Not then appearing as your cloistered scholar, with threadbare habit hardly worth a dollar, but much more like a doctor or a pope. Of double worsted was the semi-cope. Meaning there, his cape, he wears a fancy cape. Upon his shoulders and the swelling fold about him, like a bell about its mould, when it is casting rounded out his dress, he lisped a little out of wantonness, to make his English sweet upon his tongue, when he had played his harp or having sung, his eyes would twinkle and his head as bright as any star upon a frosty night. This worthy's name was Hubert, it appeared. And so here... With our friar, we see Chaucer start to get a little bit more critical. Whereas with the nun, the prior, as he just kind of left out the nice things and just complimented her on things that didn't really matter. With the friar, he's a lot more direct, saying, you know, here about, you know, 225 through 228, these ideas about, uh, easy man and penance giving, where you could hope to make a decent living with this process of indulgences. We're going to talk about with the partner as well here. Um, in this idea, where is he going to be? Not with the lepers, not with the beggars, not with the people who are poor, but anywhere a prophet might accrue. That's where you would find our friar, because mostly, he's in it for the money. Just like our next character. <laughs>